At the beginning of Arrival, we see in a flashback that Amy Adams' character Louise lost her daughter Hannah to cancer, and we think about the unfathomable weight of that grief as a tragedy. This is a sadness no parent would choose. Except that Louise Banks has come unstuck in time. During the plot of the film, she begins to experience past, present, and future all at once. And we realize these are not flashbacks, but flash forwards to a future she does not yet comprehend. When her future husband embraces her for the first time, she says, I forgot how good it felt to be held by you. In that embrace, she remembers the daughter not yet conceived, the life she would live and the death she would die, and she remembers what every parent knows and tries to forget, that the question, do you want to make a baby? Is also, do you want to make a corpse? And she remembers too that the sorrow of loss is the price we pay so the world can have this beautiful, incredible person, even if only briefly. And so... Yes. And this is how Arrival subverts sadness. I've always found the experience of playing a Sims game without cheats or expansions kind of sad. Sims like people need money to live, so to make money your Sims gonna have to get a job. So you look up a job in the newspaper and then every workday you get in the car that takes you to your job and then you just wait. You wait for your workday to be over as you watch the bar for all of your Sims needs slowly diminish. Then when they get home you do your best to fill those bars back up again in the limited time that you have. You shower, eat, engage in the bare minimum of recreation you need to not become too unhappy and try to get as much sleep as you can, just so you can afford to have your job eat away at all of your Sims needs again the next day. This tragic cycle that you've condemned your sim to, of spending most of their waking hours waiting for their job to be over at the cost of their physical and emotional needs, is one that probably hits a little too close to home for many people living under 21st century capitalism. Most of us wish we'd only have to work from 9 to 5, and that would still be half of our waking hours if we wanted to get a healthy amount of sleep, not factoring in commute time. There's even a recognized term now for intentionally sleeping too little to win back some freedom over the job that occupies so much of our life. The Sims has managed to distill, refine if you will, a very real tragedy of life under late capitalism. Wait, did I just make my first video essay again? As a content creator, it can be hard to quit the addiction to work. Feast or famine, boom or bust, that's an addiction. I wanted to write a video for Psychonauts 2, but I couldn't. Why? Because Psychonauts 2 is about addiction to work told through minimalist narrative structure. How do you write a sequel? Keep writing from where you left off. Psychonauts' philosophy of a minimalist work-life balance is expressed through a motif of the game's bosses. Agent Forsyth experiences chronic anxiety from perfectionism and financial instability. Compton Bull is afraid to attempt any pursuit because he is afraid of failure. He's burnt out. Cassiopeia struggles to maintain her sense of self due to all the careers she has had to adopt throughout her life. Psychonauts has always promoted the naive ethic of empathizing with the mentally ill rather than villainizing them. I say naive not because this ethic is wrong, it is true, you should believe this, but it alone is too naive to encompass deterrence of unethical behavior nor justice for the victims of people who are themselves victims yet are now willful offenders. The Psychonauts 2 story struggles with this complexity when the final boss, the big villain of the lore, is someone the main character loves. Ethical complexity arises when a person is not deserving of blame but must still hold the responsibility. Psychonauts 2 didn't find that answer. Can you? Stay true. Amidst a sea of manufactured, substanceless boy bands, two thirty-somethings, high off their asses, decided to make a manufactured, substanceless boy band. Though substanceless only because they did, in fact, not exist. The origins of gorillas are arguably postmodernist in nature. Aside from the fact that its members are literal works of fiction, the project was made as a middle finger to established music norms and conventions, a band unbeholden to genre and format. This rejection of the establishment and embrace of the surreal and subversive is what would inform most of their style and artistry all the way up to Song Machine, which saw them reject the album cycle altogether. Instead, they would simply release songs and videos as they came together, forming the beautiful melting pot that was Strange Times. Gorillas would then, in an act of genius, go on to subvert themselves by announcing and then subsequently cancelling their own NFTs. There they go again, shattering expectations. Minecraft, one of the most popular games in human history, is also remarkably silent. Unlike other games, there is no story to sit through, no branching narrative with multiple protagonists. In fact, there's no dialogue at all. 
You might be forgiven even for assuming that because of this, nothing is said. However, spoken words are not the only way we can communicate. Instead, Minecraft gives you nothing but the world itself. The quietly contemplative music, the animals, even the nighttime monsters. An ecosystem that may not speak, but still tells a story. So perhaps there is a dialogue after all, whether it be the quiet conversation with the world around you or the rhythmic tapping of a pickaxe deep in the earth. Did you know that in Left 4 Dead, each special infected enemy has its own set of audio cues? The special infected are these zombies with unique abilities that are more powerful than your common infected. If you hear this, you know a boomer just spawned far away. And if you hear this, you know a smoker is nearby. And that crying you hear right now? That's a witch. When you hear that, you immediately know to turn off your flashlight and be careful not to alert her. As you get closer, the music starts building until you finally see her. Because in Left 4 Dead, you hear enemies before you see them. There's gonna be hell to pay you keep accurate now. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is the black sheep of the Zelda series, but it manages to be the most heartwarming game of them all. In this particular adventure, Link heals the sorrows of many souls using the Song of Healing, taught to him by the Happy Mask Salesman. The Song of Healing soothes troubled spirits and turns them into masks. These masks do act as trophies for Link's good deeds, but they also have mechanical use too. When Link wears them, other characters treat him differently and sometimes even let him access new areas. Ultimately, Link saves the world, just like he does in every Zelda game, but he also makes the people happier. Along his journey, he maximizes the joy in the world and suggests that true happiness is not ours alone, but it's the shared happiness of all of us. I am very upset. Is it because you threw Michael out? No, it's because I can't make any sense out of those commercials for obsession. He knew that when he kissed this girl. First, you read a script and or a book, or you get ideas, and you begin to fall in love. And at the same time, you feel a thing in the air. And the thing in the air is always changing. And something about the thing in the air um, verifies your love, or it kind of goes against it. And in this case, it went, you know, with it, the thing in the air. And um, so it felt correct to go forward. People do feel this thing in the air, and it might alter our thinking a hair. Um, you, you. You don't know what you're going to fall in. The most important thing is what you fall in love with. Alvin and the Chipmunks is a story of a man betrayed so heartlessly by his three adopted sons. On his quest to build a musical empire, Uncle Ian spared no expense to pamper Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. No rules? I do have one rule. That there are no rules! Yeah. Coffee. <laughs> the finest Christmas gifts three children could ask for. What are you doing? Just taking care of my boys, Dave. It wasn't enough for them. These devilish rodents threw all of it away for some cheap love from a dad that didn't even want them in the first place. They're savings bonds. 
you know, in seven years, you're going to get to buy yourself something really nice. All Ian wanted was a little multi-million dollar boy band. And what did he get in return? Three sellouts that threw him under the bus. Discarded him when his toys no longer entertained them. All reins must fall. But his fell too early. Rest easy, old friend. I'm going to say five words that might get me hate. I don't like competitive Smash. Sports, we've all heard of them and watched them. The guy gets ball and box, boom, points. In general, sports can be seen as boring compared to the limitless possibilities of video games like Super Smash Bros. When Smash dropped, it was seen as revolutionary to some compared to fighting games of its time. You had all these goofy Nintendo characters brawling each other to death. It was the perfect combination. There were 12 characters, 9 stages, and 19 items, which were enough variability to be an exciting party game. And what did the competitive scene do to it? Four games later and almost 90 playable characters, and it's still a same style of competitive play. It's like Smash forgot it's supposed to be a party game. All these stages with huge ramifications for advantages and we go with wank. Limitless items to add chaos to matchups and what do we go with? Wank. This would be like if someone asked me to turn off items and only circular stages for Mario Kart. That's just NASCAR with Nintendo skins. I just imagine the sheer elation from someone on the edge of losing getting the Smash Ball and turning the tide in a game on Hyrule. And old head Smash players argue afterwards the game ain't like it used to. And I get there are raucous moments of joy but you reduced a huge party game to one small method of play which emphasizes in popular their culture, we like boring. Elden Ring is unlike FromSoft's previous titles in many ways, but its biggest lesson is showcased through the game's early vulnerability. FromSoft use their first boss encounters as tools to teach players various aspects of each game such as the method of approach, the importance of weaknesses, the pace of combat, or how best to utilize a new set of mechanics. Elden Ring teaches players, both new and old, that ignorance isn't bliss. The game's early boss encounters give players a very hard time disincentivizing the idea of rushing through Limgrave. This teaches the player to instead take their time to explore, and the outcome of doing so is being provided a world full of wonderful experiences, as well as the tools to make your journey more enjoyable. The player character in Elden Ring is supposed to be guided by a maiden, but you are maidenless. Maidenless. The maidenless. Only once a woman has agreed to pretend to be your maiden are you permitted to level up. Women are thus cast as possessions, and the possession of women is tied to worth. You can't even make gains if you don't hold the social capital necessary. The female coded body type is labeled Type B, which suggests its inferiority to the male coded Type A. Body. The secret optional super boss is a woman, with an attack so foul it enrages The embrace of a woman debuffs the player with a reduction of maximum health, suggesting that accepting healthy affection from a consenting woman is actually toxic mask. Jokes aside, I hadn't thought to consider misogyny and Elden Ring in the same breath before this tweet. While it's fun and can even be helpful to draw these kinds of comparisons, I wouldn't call the game misogynistic. And in case anyone thinks I'm saying that to avoid controversy, Grand Theft Auto V is misogynistic. Moonrise Kingdom is chock full of Shakespearean drama, like the two young, star-crossed lovers marrying in secret, the impending storm which builds to a blustery climax, the Benjamin Britten opera in the film's soundtrack, and trust me, I could go on. But today, let's just look at one scene to see how a Shakespearean analysis benefits the film. What kind of bird are you? Three birds are mentioned by name in this scene. A sparrow, Dove and Raven. But what exactly draws Sam to Susie, the Raven? Well, Shakespeare name checks over 60 kinds of birds throughout his works, and he imbues each with different meanings. The dove is, of course, an obvious symbol of peace, but Shakespeare once called it a star of love. And sparrow is actually a romantic term of endearment in the Elizabethan era. And in King Lear, it is caring but naive. And lastly, the Raven, whose hoarse croak announces the fatal arrival of Duncan to Macbeth's castle and flies over Othello's infected house. 
The raven symbolizes tragedy and bleakness. Sam, an orphan, is himself a tragic character, and it's that shared sadness that first bonds the two together. That breeze feels good as hell, man. Yeah, it do. Lights burn blue. Yeah, sometimes around the way where we live, the moonlight, you can catch that same breeze. Black boys look blue. It's now dead midnight. Just come through the hood and it's like everything stopped for a second. Because everyone just want to feel it. Is that wrong? Oh, no, it's not. Not his looks are my soul's food. Cold, faithful drops stand on my trembling flesh. Pity the dearth that I have pined in by longing for that food for so long a time. Yeah. Do I fear? Should make you want to cry. I feel oh, so good. I will. A mockery, King of Sin. You cry? Standing before the sun ah. of Bolingbroke. Makes me want to. Melt myself away in water drops. Didst thou but know the inly touch of love? Should I cry so much sometimes? I feel like I'm going to just turn a drive. Manyaku is a term which hasn't quite achieved the ubiquity and notoriety in anime fan circles as otaku, but is both an important concept and, for our purposes, point of departure, which is useful for developing a deeper understanding of Japanese subcultures. Hayao Miyazaki is a figure who, as it turns out, straddles both tendencies. I think pinpointing his mania is quite easy. The man loves aeronautics. I'm genuinely surprised that he didn't try to slip some kind of flying machine into Mononoke Hime. I mean, who else but an aeronautic maniac would have his final film revolve around uncritically praising the Zero? His otakudom, on the other hand, is a much deeper cut. Whether it stems from his falling in love with Bai Nyang from the 1956 film Hakuja Den, being the moment he decided to become an animator, or his detailed explanation about why Nausicaa had to have large breasts, 2D Complex appears to have left an indelible impact on the old master. Which leads me to ask, I wonder how he feels about Strike Witches? Portal 2 is a game in which GLaDOS's hubris, or excessive pride and self-confidence, is subverted and where she learns to let go of Chell after many years of testing and hatred. After GLaDOS wakes up for the first time since being destroyed and recaptures Chell, she's more confident than ever before. She makes numerous rude comments about Chell, including her weight. Most people emerge from suspension terribly undernourished. I want to congratulate you on beating the odds and somehow managing to pack on a few pounds. And personality. GLaDOS believes that there's no possible way Chell could defeat her again, especially not with a moron like Wheatley by her side. Once defeated and turned into a potato, she's still sarcastic. My slow clap processor made it into this thing. But lacks the power that made her overconfident. She's reliant upon Chell and also gets into touch with the human side of herself by remembering being Carolyn, Cave Johnson's assistant. At the end of the game when regaining power, GLaDOS finally lets Chell go and still satisfies her itch for testing with Atlas and Peabody. Despite being a robot, she learned and subverted her own hubris. In the end, she just wants Chell gone. What is in a name? If you could comprehend the greater meaning from the jump, they wouldn't need nothing else. But books and covers, the stupidity of thing, or the genius of thing, or the thing of good and bad things. If your loudest, most visible remark is completely lacking in witticism, I don't need three hours of you measuring the angle of your thumbs up, thumbs down. Regardless of content quality, this is the internet. You've got to do a bit of trolling. I'm talking bait them with the knowns, and then hook them with the wants. If you don't have both, you never had neither. Leech if you can, but if you say something, say something. The videos I look back on most positively either always optimize opposing positives or brave faux pas, both of which inwardly force and outwardly guarantee nuance. Then again, I ain't much for numbers. A good title is a good hook, but not necessarily good ID. Understatement and a recontextualization. This is the strongest technique of any writer throughout all time. They call it... The Title Drop.
One of the most common criticisms of Firewatch that I hear is that it's not really a video game. Rather, people tend towards terms like walking simulator and glorified movie. And honestly, these complaints have some validity. Firewatch does away with the boss fights, puzzles, action, and adventure that we come to expect from video games. Rather, you spend most of your time just walking around a beautiful forest. But for me, Firewatch's lack of gaminess is what makes it so special. Between the slow, meandering days spent strolling through the endless woods, chatting with Delilah on the radio, both the story and the gameplay of Firewatch challenge the player's notion that experiences need to be filled with action and drama to be meaningful. Sometimes, life is just regular old life. What Firewatch taught me is that just because something is simple, mundane even, doesn't mean it can't be beautiful. Rather, sometimes that feeling of contentedness we chase can be found in something as simple as a hike through the woods. 